Hello history fans and welcome back to another ASMR video. This is the full length, hopefully over an hour, version of yesterday's podcast episode, which was a part one of random history. So I'm just going to be reeling off random facts from history. I'm not really going to explain it. I've attempted to put it in some kind of chronological order, but it's not exact. It will be a mixture of soft-spoken, whispering, ASMR style, so I do hope you enjoy. If you do, please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and if you manage to stay awake long enough, let me know in the comments your favourite fact you learnt today. And with that, let's get into some history. Before the Bronze Age began, humans had just been using stone tools for like two million years, but don't worry, for Luro they used moss, and flutes during the Ice Age were made from bird bones. The oldest dinosaur ever was the Nysosaurus Parangtoni, from 243 million years ago, and the discovery of their fossils showed us that dinosaurs existed 10 million years earlier than we previously thought. Eoraptor lunensis came 230 million years ago in the late Triassic period and it walked on two legs and was an omnivore and the first sauropod that came 230 million years ago called Byrosaurus mm, rathi and Saturnalia topiniquium is 233 million years ago being one of the first sauropod morphs which is the lineage of the biggest dinosaurs ever. The largest recorded poo in history is a fossil from a viking, a fossilised poo is actually called a coprolite and this one is 1,200 years old. Discovered in York from the 9th century, it came from someone who ate mostly bread and meat and it was also infected with whipworm, which meant that this person often had an upset stomach. The first medical proce procedure we have evidence of is trepanation, where they drill or scrape a hole into your head. But apparently in Borneo, over 30,000 years ago, there's evidence of a leg amputation being performed on a Stone Age child. Whereas there's a skull from 6,500 BCE that show trepanation happening in France. Apparently the dumbest dinosaur was the Stegosaurus, whose brain was only the size of a walnut. But if we're talking brain sizes in relation to body size, the smallest brain would have been a sauropod morph, and that would be the dumbest type of dinosaur. The founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, were raised by a wolf. Wrestling is the oldest form of sport, with drawings of it from 20,000 years ago. Rome had seven kings before it became a republic, the last being Tarquin in 509 BCE. Ancient Spartan brides would shave their heads and wear men's clothes on their wedding day. Ancient Greeks liked to find out what was going to happen to them, so they went to hear prophecies from the Oracle of Delphi, but that could get quite expensive, and is now said to have been on the site of some sort of hallucinogenic. Ancient Egyptians wore wax cones on their head full of perfume to hide their odour, and they were mostly worn by women on top of their wigs, and they would just melt throughout the day. In Roman Britain, carpenters' workshops would have been in the front of their houses that opened up into the street in order to detox their skin through sweating and to feel closer to the gods ancient greek athletes would compete naked in the olympic games the Colosseum used to be cladded with marble but after the fall of rome the goths invaded and looted the place taking the marble and leaving bare stone when rich romans died they would have their favorite slave fight to the death over their grave which was a bit of a trend for a while Gladiators did go to proper gladiator schools, and only the very best were allowed to fight in the Colosseum. Eretiarius was the gladiator who would fight with a trident and a fishnet. Cleopatra, the last queen of Egypt, was not Egyptian, she was Greek, a descendant of Alexander the Great's Macedonian general Ptolemy. The wealthiest man to have ever lived in history was said to be Augustus, with a net worth now of 46 trillion, but since... I made that video in 2020, I found out it was actually Mansa Musa of the Mali, whose wealth is so vast it's impossible to calculate. Apparently, pink is the oldest colour, with ancient pink pigments being found in rocks that are 1.1 billion years old. So prehistorical, actually. Homer's Odyssey from 800 BCE also recognises the colour in association with dawn, and he repeats it many times when he says rosy-fingered dawn appearing. In the 17th century, a botanist started using pink when describing the edges of carnations, and in the 18th century, it became a symbol of luxury and class. 
in art it's used to portray Jesus because it used to be associated with innocence and the womb. And of course, the Roman goddess of love, Venus, is often painted surrounded by pink because it's associated with her due to it being a mixture of the passionate red and pure white. Ancient Egyptians worshipped over 2,000 gods, but some you might know are Ra, king of the gods and father of creation, Thoth, the master of magic and knowledge, Osiris, who was king of the dead. We had toilet systems as far back as 3000 BCE. The Neolithic settlement of Skara Brai, or Bray, has drainage systems thought to be toilets, and the palace of Knossos in Crete has remnants of the queen's toilet, big earthenware pans connected to a water system. Draco, the ancient Greek lawmaker, made a lot of things punishable by death, like stealing an apple, but he died by suffocation because there was a big event in Athens for people to show their gratitude towards him. And when he came out on stage, people threw so much stuff at him that he suffocated under the pile. The oldest complaint ever written comes from 1750 BCE, from a Mesopotamian man, Nani, who writes to complain about some copper he was sold. The Celts didn't leave any written evidence of important historical events. They favoured oral history instead, with druids and scholars just learning tales by heart for hundreds of years. But there's a few fragments. Cleopatra learnt up to 12 languages, was an intelligent and strong leader, not just a seductress. In ancient Rome, carts were banned during the day because the town was so busy, and instead they were only allowed at night. Headaches were recorded as early as ancient Egypt, and then Hippocrates described the flashing lights you see before a migraine um, when he talks about visual disturbances. And Stone Age people, or as far back as 7000 BCE, left evidence of headache neuroscience and neolithic neurosurgery because there's skulls with evidence of trepanation which was removing a segment of your skull to release evil spirits or demons. Mithridates feels like a slightly unlucky name with the fifth being assassinated at a banquet in the year 120-ish. He was poisoned. And then the sixth tried to poison himself but failed because he'd been taking the antidote all his life. Purple was a status symbol in ancient Rome, and it was treason for anyone other than the emperor to dress fully in purple. Emperor Claudius's third wife, Messalina, was apparently a nymphomaniac who challenged the prostitute to who could have the most sexual partners in one night, and she won. Gaius Fallacius Catullus wrote a poem that addressed two of his critics, and it was so vulgar that it wasn't translated from Latin until the 20th century. Google it. Caligula often appeared in women's clothes in public. Caracalla slaughtered 20,000 Egyptians because they wrote a play that mocked him. Claudius avoided the assassination of the rest of his immediate family because he had a disability, so no one saw him as a threat. And he went on to record quite a bit of history for us. To keep evil spirits out of their homes, the ancient Greeks would paint tar across their door so the spirits would get stuck and not be able to enter the home and spread illness. According to DNA samples taken from his body, King Tutankhamun's parents were also siblings, which isn't shocking for ancient Egypt. The Romans used stale urine as mouthwash because the ammonia in it did act as a cleaning agent, but then urine was so in demand that traders had to pay a tax on it. The Sahara Desert was once home to speeding crocodiles millions of years ago, and fossil hunters in 2009 found remains that show crocodiles had land-type legs that meant they could sort of gallop and reach ridiculous speeds. In ancient Asia, and some parts up until the 19th century, death by elephant was popular as a form of execution. You might be executed by the elephant's blade having the elephant's tusks having blades tied to it, or they could twist or break your limbs, or they could simply crush your skull. The Eastern Roman Empire had a weapon called Greek fire, which was essentially a flamethrower built into their ship. It was mostly used in naval warfare, so it was very deadly, because throwing water at it would only add to the fire, and it could actually be projected quite a distance. The Romans spread something called night soil over their gardens, which was a fertiliser made using their own faeces, which did help the plants grow, but also massively spread diseases. Women would use a herb called sylphium that worked as a natural contraceptive, and it was actually used so much so that in Roman times it went extinct. In 2018, archaeologists in Pompeii discovered the skeleton of a very unlucky man. He managed to survive the first wave of Pompeii's destruction in 79 AD, but shortly after, a boulder fell on his head and killed him. 
The woolly mammoths were still alive when the Egyptians were first building the pyramids. Cleopatra lived closer to the invention of the iPhone than she did to the building of the first pyramids. Emperor Alagabalus used the guts of sacrificed people to tell the future and kept lions in his palace. Emperor Caligula gave his favourite horse Incatatus the role of senator, a house, and planned to make him consul before he was assassinated, but I don't believe that. Cleopatra's reign was closer to the moon landings than it was to the Great Pyramids being built. In ancient Greece, skirts were supposedly manly, and wearing trousers could get you mocked for being effeminate. Ancient Egyptians in the 1350s BCE would weigh on barley or wheat seeds, and if it sprouted quickly, it meant the woman was pregnant. Now, modern studies actually show that that can be accurate 70 to 80 percent of the time. The ancient Greeks, however, had a lot less understanding of the human body, and the onion test was created by Hippocrates, who said that women should put an onion or a smelly vegetable in their vagina overnight. If your breath smelt the next day, you weren't pregnant because the smell had a good clear tunnel through your body. But if your breath didn't smell, it meant there was clearly a fetus blocking the way. The most common first step in an ancient Roman's makeup routine was lightening the skin because it showed that you had a very easy life and hadn't been working out in the sun all day. Some women even went as far as to draw veins onto their forehead to appeal so pale that they were see-through. But that idea might just come from the Victorians because that's what they liked to do. And a lot of historical inaccuracies were invented by the Victorians. For blush, they might have used wine or mulberries, or some women even rubbed brown seaweed into their cheeks. Burnt cork was used for lashes, or soot could be used for a smoky eye, or minerals were used for a brighter look. Unibrows were also popular and drawn on, and because these products would smell, perfumes were made using flowers to cover it up. Emperor Caligula never actually made his horse a senator, that's one of those myths from history. The Romans sometimes used powdered mouse brains as toothpaste. During the festival of Saturnalia, slaves were treated as equals. The Romans invented concrete and their streets were covered in graffiti. Most Romans drank wine, but slaves and soldiers drank something called posca, which is a weird vinegary diluted drink. And they didn't drink beer because it was seen as barbaric, but we drank it over here in Roman Britain. Some of them ate flamingo tongues, and their actual job was plucking armpit hair. Emperor Tiberius apparently banned kissing in public. Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were raised by wolves, and some leaders would ingest a small amount of poison each day to build up their immunity. When soldiers were first ordered to invade Britain in 43 CE, they didn't want to because they didn't know what was on the land, and they thought they might have been monsters. The slaves and labourers who built the pyramids were often paid in beer, which was refreshing and apparently nutritional. Apparently, Emperor Nero's last words were, Oh, what an artist dies in me. Emperor Claudius's supposed last words were, Oh dear, I've made a mess of it. And when Emperor Vespasian was dying of dysentery, he said, Oh dear, I think I'm becoming a god. Gladiator actually means swordsman, because gladius in Latin is sword. So it's literally a man with a sword, even though they didn't all have swords, some had tridents and nets. No one knows when gladiators first came about, though, because the Roman Empire is so huge. But an ancient Roman author dates the first gladiator games to 264 BCE, whereas others say the idea was stolen from the Etruscans. Gladiator outfits weren't designed to actually protect them. They're actually to look cool and play the part. And they were the celebrities of their day with the fangirls, and they even sold their sweat, because apparently it cured diseases. The Romans once filled an arena with water to recreate famous naval battles. They used a sponge on a stick as a loo roll. They wrote on wax tablets. Emperor Caligula once held a meeting just to tell the people there he could have them killed if he really wanted to. Apples were the symbol of Aphrodite, so if you threw an apple at someone in ancient Greece, you weren't just being annoying, you were declaring your love. Aeschylus, the Greek playwright, famous for tragedies, was killed when an eagle dropped a tortoise on his head, thinking it was a rock that would smash it open, but I don't know how we know that. <laughs> the Roman Empire had 200 amphitheatres, and the Colosseum was the biggest one that took eight years to build, starting in 80 AD, originally called the Flavian Amphitheatre because it was built during the Flavian dynasty. Julius Caesar hated that he was balding so much so that he made it illegal for anyone to stand above him and look down on him. Guests at Roman banquets were served ostrich brains and cobwebs were used to stop bleeding. Not necessarily at the same events, I just mean in Rome. In ancient Greece, they thought redheads became vampires after dying. 
Elephants were the tanks of the ancient world, and armoured elephants were often used to terrify the enemy and make your army difficult to kill, especially since people wouldn't have really seen them before. And Hannibal famously crossed the Alps with his elephants, and it's from this time that the Romans began the random belief that elephants were scared of mice, possibly. Pliny the Elder wrote that elephants are scared by the smallest squeal after the Romans used pigs to counter the elephants. And they were maybe scared? Not sure it's a reliable source, but that's where the rumour began. In ancient Greece, states were usually at war, but before the Olympics, a truce was called so everyone could travel to Olympia. Dinosaur fossils have been found on all seven continents, despite going extinct 66 million years ago. The first pyramids were built in 2780 BCE and Cleopatra lived in 50 BCE. The ancient Spartan school system was designed to create the perfect warrior with boys living in barracks. There were like 700 known species of extinct dinosaurs. Spartan wedding rituals involved the husband-to-be capturing their bride. Then she would shave her head and dress in men's clothes. After the marriage, men would sneak out of the barracks to see their wives. The word dinosaur comes from the Greek dinos, which means terrible, and saurus, which means lizard. So the direct translation is terrible lizard. The woolly mammoth died out only about 3,700 years ago, thousands of years after Stonehenge or the pyramids were built, which really messed with my perception of time because the Ice Age was much further away than that in my head. Cats were domesticated over 9,500 years ago, with remains of a pet cat being found 4,000 years before even ancient Egyptians existed. But dogs were the first animals to be domesticated over 20,000 years ago, after evolving from wolves. The oldest game in history is the rural game of Ur, or Ur that was discovered from Mesopotamia 4,500 years ago, and the concept is to just get across the board quickest, a bit like chess, but the middle pieces were used for fortune telling. The first pub in England came in the year 43. After the Romans invaded, they bought Tabernes. The Spartan general Pausanias was bricked into a temple of Athena and left to die, but he then haunted the temple until eventually he was persuaded to leave by a musician. There were actually female gladiators called gladiatrix. Marcus Licinius Crassus was the wealthiest man in Rome at the time when he died, and to show his thirst for wealth was disgusting, the Parthians poured molten gold down his throat. Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times because he cl- declared himself dictator for life. It's thought that Alexander the Great was buried alive horrifically. He had been ill for 12 days before, seemingly dying, but it took six days for any decay to show, which makes people think he had a neurological disorder that meant he was actually just paralysed when being buried and would have been aware of what was happening. In like 310 BCE, Babylonian astronomers observed the solar system all the way to Saturn, and a Greek astronomer got the position of the Earth correct in the heliocentric model. The ancient Egyptians would shave their heads to avoid lice, but then wear wigs made of human hair to avoid sunburn. Vikings didn't wear horned helmets that was made up by a 19th century artist. There's no archaeological evidence for them, and helmets were worn to protect them in battle, so horns wouldn't really be helpful. It was Karl Emil Doppler who gave his Vikings horned helmets as their character costumes in a performance of a Wagner opera in the 1870s, and people liked the myth, so it stuck. And again, Victorian inaccuracies. But there's archaeological evidence for horned helmets coming from other peoples. These helmets came from the Bronze Age with horns, but there's also drawings of them in cave art in Mediterranean Bronze Age times too. Days of the week were named after Viking gods, Odin or Woden. It's Woden's Day, Wednesday. Tuesday and Friday were named after Tyr and Frigg, the god and goddess of war and marriage, and Thor or Thunder. It's Thursday. Words like snort, lump, scrawny and anger all come from the Old Norse language. Vikings had really good hygiene and were relatively well groomed. Viking is actually a 19th century phrase. At their time, they would have been referred to as Norse, Norsemen or Danes. Sickly Viking children were abandoned in the wilderness or thrown out to sea. Viking women could request a divorce or inherit property. When an important Viking died, they were put on a boat with all their belongings and pushed out to sea and set on fire. The Vikings liked being blonde so much that they would use a certain soap to try and bleach their hair. The Viking explorer Leif Erikson beat Christopher Columbus to discovering America by over 500 years. The first Viking settlement in Greenland was founded by Leif's father, Erik the Red, who was banished to Greenland from Iceland after murdering several men. When they discovered America, they settled in Newfoundland in the year 1000. They navigated the sea using ravens. They would let them out of the cage and follow it to dry land. And at night they would have used the stars, and it seems to be a good system because it worked. 
when in 793 they sailed across the Great North Sea and invaded us. They cared a lot about their looks, dyeing their hair blonde, and their beards. They used combs and tweezers and ear spoons to keep clean and tidy, and bathed a lot more often than other people at the time. They settled disputes in court and eventually lived cohesively with the Saxons. I feel like I've said this one, but a preserved poo is called a coprolite, and the largest one ever found comes from a viking in the 9th century. Coprolite means fossilised human poo, but paleofeces means human droppings found on an archaeological expedition. While some vikings lived on ships and only got off to burn villages to the ground, the vast majority were just farmers who lived on land with their families, yielding just enough crop to feed them. Like I said, they had excellent hygiene and they bathed at least once a week, which was amazing for the time. And the excavation sites have found combs, tweezers and ear cleaners. I think we're on to the Middle Ages now, because the Battle of Hastings was fought on the 14th of October, 1066. It began the Norman conquest of England as one of the most important and decisive battles in our history. We have three, maybe four kings who died on the toilet. In 1016, King Edmund got stabbed to death while he was on the toilet. In 1216, King John died near or on a toilet of dysentery. In 1760, George II died on the loo, as you know from the Horrible History song, I am sure. And in 1135, we have the most debated one, with Henry I, who died after gorging on a river eel, a lamprey. Oxford University existed for hundreds of years before the Aztec Empire was founded. Of course, these countries existed and were populated, but the empire didn't start till 1400, and Oxford started in 1060 or 90. The Battle of Hastings didn't actually happen in Hastings, it happened in a place called Battle, but I suppose historians don't like the thought of having to say the Battle of Battle. In 1187, when the Knights Templar were doing a raid on a Saracen camp, one of them tripped and fell headfirst into a big hole that was their toilet, and he drowned. But he fell so noisily that he woke up the Saracens, who surrounded the Knights and killed them all. There's a temple in Turkey that dates to 11,000 years ago, which predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. Historians aren't really sure what it signifies, but it shows that organised religion happened an awfully long time ago possibly even before organised agriculture. An Anglo-Saxon manuscript gave us evidence of a 9th century onion and garlic eye remedy that scientists proved did actually kill 90% of the specific bacteria of the infection it was supposed to be curing. The Voynich manuscript has been dated to the 1400s, but codebreakers are still unable to work out its meaning or origins. In the Middle Ages, a pig attacked a child, and the child later died from its wounds, so the pig was arrested, put in prison, and put on trial for murder, where it was found guilty and executed by hanging in 1386. When forks were first introduced to Italy in the 11th century, they were seen as an offence to God because they were artificial hands, so they were sacrilegious. In the 13th century, Pope Gregory III declared war on cats. Black cats were seen as a form of Satan or an agent of Satan, and so they should be destroyed, so he ordered for their exterminations. But this unfortunately led to an increase in the number of plague-carrying rats. Edward II is said to have died in 1327 after having a red-hot poker shoved up his bottom. But that's apparently a popular myth, and he actually just died in captivity. The first person killed in the Battle of Hastings was supposedly William the Conqueror's jester, Taylorfer. In the 1300s, a loaf of bread could cost the equivalent now of 14p, whereas the average worker earned about £9 a week. Henry I gave permission for his granddaughters to be blinded and to have the tip of their noses cut off because their father killed the son of a baron? What? So their mother tried to kill Henry with a crossbow but missed and leapt from the castle to escape. Roland the Farter was Henry II's favourite jester. As you might guess by his name, he would entertain the medieval court with his flatulence and at Christmas would perform the favourite act, one whistle and a jump and a fart, which I would assume is self-explanatory. He was the king's favourite so much so that he was given 30 acres of land and a manor in Suffolk. Oxford University opened in 1096, but the Aztec Empire originated by Lake Texcoco in 1325. There we go. The most famous female serial killer was the Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory, accused of torturing and killing over 650 young women in her castle, and some say she is the inspiration for Dracula as the Blood Countess. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial for laying an egg because it was the work of Satan. In 1494, a pig was charged with killing a baby. Witnesses said the pig got into the home and ate the baby's face. He was found guilty of murder and hung. 
hanged. In 1510, rats were put on trial for destroying a field of barley. Their defence lawyer said attending court was too risky for the rats because of local cats and dogs, and because a reasonable fear of death was a excuse the humans could make, surely a rat could too, so the trial was postponed indefinitely. Havoc was a medieval battle cry. It released the army from formation so they could go wild and loot the place. It was only ever given if the battle was definitely won, so it was thought to be so dangerous it could only be given with permission of the army commander. And if you cried havoc without permission, you could be executed. The Bayeux Tapestry isn't a tapestry, it's an embroidery and largely inaccurate. King Harold didn't get shot through the eye, I'm afraid. Despite being King of England for ten years, Richard Lionheart only spent six months in the country. Henry I died after eating too much fish. He loved lampreys, which are just gross, and he ate too much and died. In 1518, there was a dancing plague in Strasbourg, with general consensus being some sort of mass hysteria. Quarantine was actually a thing in the 14th century. Venetians imposed a 40-day isolation of any ships uh, that arrived during the Black Death, called Quarantina. William the Conqueror was crowned on Christmas Day in 1066, and a guard misheard a cry of acclamation f um, for protesters and massacred some innocent bystanders. In medieval Venice, women wore a sort of wooden stilt to protect their dress and sh shoes, because shoes were made of silk or leather, so Chopin shoes were invented. Between the 17th and 19th century, there was a little ice age where the River Thames in London froze over the most often, and the Stuarts used to have frost fairs on them. Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was married to his older brother, Prince Arthur, who died in 1502. Bloody Mary's nickname is kind of unfair out of all the Tudor monarchs because she's not actually the most murderous. Elizabeth had 600 people executed, and Henry had over 70,000 people murdered. In Tudor times, if you were wealthy and you wanted to show it, you would have black teeth because sugar was so expensive that only the rich could eat it and they'd eat so much it rotted their teeth. Elizabeth I's dressing routine is the longest of any monarch ever. By the end of her life, it would apparently take her serving women four hours to get her dressed. She originally wore wigs that matched her hair colour but eventually needed makeup to cover the hair loss and the scars from smallpox. As she got older, Thicker makeup was piled on to give her the mask of youth, but as I'm sure you know, cosmetics that were used caused more damage to her skin than ageing would have ever done, because putting a mixture of white lead and vinegar on your hands, face and neck every day surprisingly causes pretty bad corrosion. Lady Jane Grey was executed on the 10th of February 1554 after watching her husband go off for his execution and watching his remains be brought back to the Tower of London. Even though it wasn't easy to keep clean in medieval times, it may not have been as smelly as we think. They did try to have a bath in a bathhouse, compared to the Tudors and Georgians who would have just stank. Henry VIII was apparently a hoarder. He was six foot two and weighed 120 pounds by the end of his life. He was also a hypochondriac who self-medicated and wrote his own prescription book. King Henry VIII had servants called grooms of the stool who were there to wipe his bottom after he went to the toilet, and it's said that those four men were knighted during his reign. He owned 154 recorders, 19 violas, and he played the lute and harpsichord, and was a tenor singer who liked to perform duets and sight read. Tudor makeup was made of a variety of things. Some was made of plant leaves and roots, whereas others was a mix of white lead and vinegar. It was used as a symbol of status or to hide the scarring from various diseases like smallpox. Red ochre was used to stain their lips and cheeks, or sometimes vermilion was used as a blush as well. And coal was used to darken eyelashes, which was one of the few Tudor makeup hacks that came over from the Middle East during the Crusades. And they used saffron and cumin seeds and oil to dye their hair blonde. But Elizabeth I had over 80 wigs and hair pieces. Henry VII tried to marry Catherine of Aragon after his wife and son Arthur died. Bear in mind, Arthur had been married to Catherine of Aragon before. But Catherine's mum, Isabella, was like, um, no. And they agreed that instead she would marry Henry's other son, Henry VIII. Her popular Tudor game was Merrill's, which is kind of like Connect Four today. The average life expectancy for Tudors was 35 to 40. So during Henry VIII's reign, over half his subjects were under 18. Mary, Queen of Scots, apparently washed her face in wine to protect her complexion, and sometimes even bathed in it. 
During the Salem witch trials, the accused women weren't actually burned, but mostly jailed and hanged. Shakespeare invented about 1,700 words. Some were already invented, he just used them in their plays and made them used, be used more commonly. But some of his inventions were accommodation, gnarled, gossip, leapfrog, obscene, never-ending, sanctimonious, suspicious. Tudors enjoyed exotic pets. The Queen Mary had a parrot, and Elizabeth I had a monkey. The first modern flushable toilet was invented in 1596, or rather it's described in that year by Sir John Harrington, who created it for his godmother, Queen Elizabeth I. It was a two-foot deep bowl, waterproofed with wax or resin, with a water coming from a cistern above. If you had a cough in Tudor England, you might be treated with spiders in butter. Anne Boleyn, of course, has many ghosts, often seen headless, in Hever Castle, Winds Castle, Blickling Hall, but probably most famously at the Tower of London. Like in 1864, when a guard saw a woman glide towards him one night in the courtyard where she died. Saying bless you goes back to Elizabethan times, when people would say it after you sneezed to stop the devil entering your body. In the 16th century, the wealthy elite used to eat dead bodies, with Egyptian mummies being a favourite, because it was believed the cadaver could cure illness. In 1713, Captain Basil Hood and his crew stole a herd of cattle from land, but when they got on ship they got really ill and vomited everywhere. And when the navy inevitably caught up with the rubbish pirates, they let them go free because the ship stank so much. One of the best-selling novels of the 15th century was an erotic novel called The Tale of Two Lovers, and it was actually written by Pope Pius II before he assumed his religious position. Oliver Cromwell died in September 1658, and three years later, in 1661, his body was exhumed and posthumously beheaded by Charles II, who put his head on a spike outside Westminster Abbey. Charles II lived his reign as a Protestant, but on his deathbed converted to Catholicism, because he thought the people wouldn't accept a Catholic king. In April 1640, Oliver Cromwell had an election party, where food like eel stew was served. Later, he would be thought of as king in all but name, and in 1657, would have his face put on coins. Charles II posthumously beheaded Cromwell for revenge. Only six people died in the Great Fire of London in 1666, but it did destroy 135,000 homes. Claude de Val was a French highwayman in England. He once played music and danced with a lady he was robbing, after which he stole less money from her than usual. When he was eventually caught, Charles II quite liked him and tried to have him freed, but he was still hung. There's many different stories explaining why we call beef or steak sirloin, but the best and the most common involves Charles II. He was visiting family in Horton Estate, where he was served a large cutting of beef for dinner, and he loved it so much so that he stood up and stated, A noble joint, by St George it shall have a name. And he drew his sword and knighted it on the table, saying, Loin, we dub you knight, henceforth be sirloin. Other versions involve Henry VIII or James I, all of which are quite amusing, but more boringly, it probably just comes from the original French word instead. When Charles II came back to fight Oliver Cromwell during the Battle of Worcester, he was hiding in Boscobel House in Shropshire, but the house became too dangerous to hide in, so he ended up hiding in an oak tree. Captain Morgan was actually a real person. Sir Henry Morgan was knighted by Charles II. He was a Welsh privateer who fought with the English against the Spanish in the Caribbean. In 1644, Oliver Cromwell banned eating pie because it was a form of pagan pleasure and the ban wasn't lifted until the restoration came in about 1660. In 18th century England, pineapples were really rare, so they were a very high status symbol, and those who could afford them would sometimes just carry them round with them to show how rich they were. It's said that Charles II was presented one by his royal gardener, who was the first to grow one in England. The Stuart era had seven monarchs, starting with James I in 1566, then Charles I, Cromwell, Charles II, James II, William and Mary, then Anne in 1714. Napoleon Bonaparte used to wander the streets of Paris dressed as the lower class of the bourgeoisie, hoping to find out what the people thought of their emperor. He used to write soppy love letters and in 1715 wrote a romantic novella about a heroic revolutionary French soldier who engineered his death in the front of a charge towards the enemy after his wife was unfaithful, supposedly paralleling his own relationship with the Queen of Sweden and Norway. 
His soldiers also discovered the Rosetta Stone during the 1799 Egyptian campaign. He used to sing when agitated, and he wasn't that small for the time. A monkey in Hartlepool was arrested for being a French spy during the Napoleonic Wars. During the Napoleonic Wars, a French ship was wrecked on the coast, and the only survivor was the captain's pet monkey that he liked to dress in military uniform. And at that point, if any French military was found on English land, they were executed. So locals at the time hadn't really seen a French person in real life, supposedly, and the propaganda cartoons they would have been seeing would have been showing them in a satirical form anyway, because they're the bad guys in this situation. So you can maybe sort of forgive their ignorance, but the daft bit is that there was a trial and obviously the monkey couldn't answer anything, so it was dragged to the town square where it was hung. But there's arguments now that say it could have been a small boy, not a monkey, because a powder monkey was the name for a small boy employed to prime the cannons on warships at the time. That makes slightly more sense, I think. A pirate doctor's cure for scurvy was bloodletting, and they even used hemlock as medicine, and if he had a bad cut on your arm or leg, it would have just been chopped off and sealed with hot tar to save it from rotting or getting infected. The Duke of Beaufort liked playing tennis inside his house, um, which was called Badminton House, and then he started playing the Indian game of Poonah, which was tennis with a shuttlecock, safer for inside the house, but then he claimed it as his own creation. Georgian people used to brick up their windows so they didn't have to pay the window tax. Some pirates, like those on Black Bart's ship, had to follow very strict rules, like they weren't allowed to go out after eight, weren't allowed to gamble on board, or fight and they would even vote on things and split their treasure. But if you did break a rule, you were marooned. Ned Low, the pirate, cut off the ears of the captain of a captured whaling ship and made him eat them. Napoleon once requested for a rabbit hunt to be arranged for him and his men, but when they were released from their cages, they charged at the men, so technically Napoleon was attacked by a horde of bunnies. The sandwich was created in 1762 in England by John Montague, who was in the middle of a very long card game as an infamously problematic gambler, and he requested something to eat with his hands, so he was bought some meat between bread. In 1740, the Roman Catholics in Bavaria founded a secret society called the Order of the Pugs, where members had to wear dog collars and scratch at the door to get in, and it was apparently active until 1902. Having two braids is called the milkmaid's braid, because milkmaids would have two pigtail braids and then tie them up to keep them out of the way of the cow they were milking. Leonardo da Vinci was only a year younger than Christopher Columbus. Abraham Lincoln was 12 years old when Napoleon died. Nelson died at the Battle of Trafalgar on the HMS Victory. But rather than bury him at sea, he was preserved in a cask of brandy in the hold and brought back to London. In the 1700s, powdered mummy and the ground-up skull of someone who had died a violent death was used to treat epilepsy. When Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI were beheaded, people apparently dipped their handkerchiefs into their blood to keep as a souvenir, which was confirmed by scientists in 2011 who tested some blood-stained handkerchiefs and found the blood of Louis XVI on them from 1793. In Georgian England, tea was really expensive because it was imported from China, so they had special boxes made that had locks on them to put the tea in, and it was always kept within the eye line of the mistress of the house, which is why having tea was such an occasion. After George Washington was president, he opened up a whiskey distillery, and by 1799 it was the biggest in the country, producing 11,000 gallons of whiskey. A basic wig in the Stuart era would cost you a full week's wages, and that's like a basic boring wig. In the 18th century, with Europe's elite, fox tossing was a popular game, where, as you'd guess, see how high and far you can throw a fox. George Washington didn't know dinosaurs existed, because the first fossils weren't discovered until 1824, and he died in 1799. The term hooker comes from the Civil War general, Joseph Hooker, who used to bring prostitutes on campaign with him to help his men's morale. Until Georgian times, boxing seemingly was just standing there being punched, because it wasn't until 1805 that Bill Richmond did the first dodge, 
called a bob and weave. The quickest excavations of Pompeii happened in 1806, when Napoleon's sister, Queen Caroline, was married to the King of Naples and she pushed things along. King George III was the first to study science as part of his education, and he had an astronomical observatory. After inventing the roller skates, John Joseph Merlin didn't think about stopping, didn't invent brakes, and went straight into a mirror. On the 15th of May 1800, George III survived two assassination attempts. In the morning, a bullet barely missed him and killed the civil servant next to him, and in the evening at the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane, he was again shot at by a veteran. That this time, he simply said, the show must go on. The Gordon riots during the Georgian era were so wild and completely lawless, they kept calling for more and more police intervention, which eventually led to the creation of the Metropolitan Police in 1829. Edward Teach would weave hemp into his beard so that before he went to attack a ship, he looked terrifying. It's said he had 14 wives. He started as a privateer, serving on an English ship during the War of the Spanish Succession. But like a lot of privateers, when the war ended in 1713, he turned to piracy, becoming one of the most notorious pirates in the Golden Age of Piracy, on his infamous boat, the Queen Anne's Revenge. Apparently pirates wore eye patches, so one eye was always adjusted to the lighting and darkness below deck so they would like just adjust quickly pirate ships had strict codes of conduct called articles that even sometimes had basic forms of welfare in regency england ice cream was popular with parmesan cheese being a popular flavor the average working man's yearly wage would have been 15 pounds which is also what it would have cost to light a ballroom with candlesticks for one night and a murder scene was considered a form of entertainment with members of the public being allowed to go in have a look mess things up go up to the body destroy evidence until eventually the body would be removed to the closest pub where it was put in their cool room until the coroners arrived and a popular cure if you're feeling a little bit poorly was to drink seawater mixed with milk before the 19th century dentures were made from the teeth of dead soldiers and it's said that after the battle of waterloo dentists ran onto the battlefield and raided thousands of dead bodies for their teeth abraham lincoln was in the wrestling hall of fame losing only once in 300 contests in 1800 over 40% of brides went to the altar pregnant in 1876 the telephone was invented by alexander graham bell and he said the correct way to answer was by picking up the phone and saying ahoy I actually learned that from the Big Bang Theory. In the 19th century, Alexandra, Princess of Wales, was a fashion icon, but she suffered a rheumatism which left her disabled, and she had to use a walking stick to help walk. But the elite women in society admired her and copied everything she did, so a limp became a fashion trend. The first steam-powered fairground ride was introduced in 1865 in Norfolk. It was a roundabout. Nintendo was founded in 1889, which was also when Jack the Ripper was still about. Victorians used zinc oxide makeup to appear paler and painted veins on to appeal see-through. The Victorians would take pictures of their dead loved ones, most commonly children, who they would dress in white and pose in chairs. London has probably got the underground tube to the last public hanging in the UK in 1868. The first tube station was Aldersgate in 1865. At the time of Victoria's wedding, it was common for dresses to be in any colour you wanted, but she wanted to show off the lace embroidery of her dress, so she had it made in white, and then said her guests could not wear white too. And apparently she then had the design patterns for her dress destroyed, so that no one could copy it. In 1896, we have the shortest war in history that lasted 38 minutes on the 27th of August. The Victorian era was a thriving time for the arts, not just industrialisation. There's authors like Emily Bronte, Charles Dickens and Oscar Wilde, and books like Alice in Wonderland, Treasure Island and The Jungle Book. In 1871, we have the Bank Holidays Act that gave us extra days off during the year. And we have the very first travel agent, Thomas Cook, starting to sell holidays to the seaside. Lewis Carroll's real name is Charles Dodson. Heroin was once an acceptable medicine the doctors prescribed for everything from coughs to headaches to rheumatisms. The nursery rhyme Mary Had a Little Lamb was based on the 11-year-old Mary Sawyer, who was once followed to school by her pet lamb, and then in the 1860s she helped raise money for a church by selling the wool from her lamb. In the 1830s, ketchup was used as a popular medicine, used by John Cook to cure indigestion in 1834, and it wasn't until the 19th century it became a popular source. The hats we commonly associate with cowboys is probably inaccurate, as the 19th century cowboys would have still been wearing bowler hats. 
nipple piercings were popular in the Victorian era, Queen Isabella of Bavaria started the trend with her dresses and necklines coming all the way down to her waist so she could properly show off her diamond nipple piercings. Aristocratic Victorian women chose gold rings and a lot of the time would attach them with a gold chain that was said to help make your boobs grow evenly, with some doctors even recommending piercings to make breastfeeding easier. The Victorians took pictures of their dead relatives because it was such a new and expensive thing that it was probably the only time they could afford to do it. William Buckland was the first person to study geology at Oxford University in 1801 and he's famous for his teaching methods because he would shout questions at his pupils while thrusting a hyena skull at them. But apparently his ultimate goal in life was to taste every animal on earth. His favourite meal was apparently mice on toast, and he would host parties where he would serve puppy, porpoises and panthers, among many other weird things. But the worst thing he did was in 1840, when visiting Lord Harcourt, who had somehow come to own a silver locket that apparently contained the mummified heart of King Louis XIV of France. The locket was only bought out on very special occasions, for very special visitors. It was passed around the table for everyone to admire, and when it got to Buckland, he grabbed the opportunity to be disgusting, and said, I've eaten many strange things in my life, but never have I eaten the heart of a king. And you can guess what he did next. Disgusting. Poor Victorian children had lots of different gross jobs, but one of the worst would have been helping the night soil man. Before they had plumbing in Victorian times, the poo would just collect in the cesspit beneath toilets, until the night soil man came in his cart to collect it. It's called night soil for two reasons. One, because it was done at night to be more discreet, and two, because the Victorians didn't like saying poo. How improper. Queen Victoria laid the first stone in the foundations of the Royal Albert Hall on the 20th of May, 1867. Victorians liked wearing black because of the pollution. Of course it was popular to wear black because the Queen only wore black after the death of her husband. But also, the Victorian era was so smoggy and the Industrial era brought dirt and soot and muck, as did people's fireplaces. So black masks the colour of soot and also the colour the pollution was creating. Some wealthy Victorians kept men in their gardens as gnomes, like pets. They were called hermits and they would live in the hidden bits of a wealthy Victorian's expansive gardens and they weren't allowed to groom themselves, so they did look like real gnomes. During the Victorian era, it was fashionable to wear big hats with taxidermy birds on, and things went even more extreme with the famous taxidermist Walter Potter, who created scenes using taxidermy animals, his most famous being the kitten's wedding. Victorians also took their skincare seriously, using rubber face masks that you could rub various concoctions onto and then leave on your inevitably sweaty face overnight. And to stay pale, women would eat chalk wafers laced with arsenic, which did work, you would have a very ghostly pale complexion. <laughs> but obviously because you were now addicted to a toxic substance, not because your skin's glowing. Coca-Cola was created in 1886. It's older than the Eiffel Tower that was constructed in 1889. The Victorians were so obsessed with Egyptian mummies that they would hold parties just to unwrap them, and they even had clubs where they would eat anything they deemed exotic. Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland, inspired by Alice Liddell, whose father he worked with at Oxford University. Charles Dickens was scared of trains after one he was travelling on fell off a bridge, so he refused to ride one again. Fair enough but he missed the inquest that was investigating the crash because at the time he'd been travelling with his mistress. In the 1840s, people would say prunes when having their pictures taken because smiling was seen as childish. Lord Byron had a pet bear while at Cambridge University. The first postal system was introduced in 1840 and was called the Penny Post, with Queen Victoria being the first on the stamp. Jack the Ripper was still around when Nintendo was founded in Japan in 1889, and you could take the London Underground to the last public hanging in England. Michael Barrett was hanged outside Newgate Prison on the 26th of May 1868, whereas the Metropolitan Line of the Tube opened in 1863. The Great Wall of China had been started to be built in the 3rd century, it wasn't complete, until 1878, two years after Alexander Graham Bell made the first phone call. Children in Victorian England were used as chimney sweeps because they could fit up the narrow chimney and they were as young as three years old. Charles Dickens and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle were both part of a ghost club, a paranormal investigation society of Cambridge academics. Saying OK comes from the 1830s in America when people in Boston started to purposefully misspell abbreviations. 
instead of all correct, they would put all correct. And the press caught on with the president in 1840, even using it in his re-election campaign after his supporters set up old Kinderhook or OK clubs. In 1998, 1,200 bones were found under Benjamin Franklin's home used for studying anatomy. Mark Twain predicted his own death, supposedly. In 1909, he said, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I do not go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said no doubt. Now there are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, and they must go out together. And then on the 20th of April 1910, the comet appeared. And the next day, when it was at his brightest, he died of a heart attack. An art of Narnia was inspired by the castles in Ireland that C.S. Lewis grew up around. Before we had alarm clocks, we had Knockeruppers, who was a person hired to shoot dried peas through a blowgun at your window to wake you up. Between 1900 and 1920, tug-of-war was hosted as an Olympic sport, and there were five Summer Olympic Games between those years, at which Britain won the most medals, winning five, beating the USA's three. In 1903, a small group of women led by Emmeline Pankhurst gathered in Manchester to form the Women's Social and Political Union, which was the start of the story of the suffragettes. Fourteen years before the Titanic sank, Morgana Robertson wrote a novella, called Futility, which was about a large, unsinkable ship called Titan that hit an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank. Strangely enough, it didn't have any lifeboats. Sometimes in the trenches of World War I, if a soldier was caught in a gas attack, they would wee on their handkerchief and put it over their nose and mouth because the chemicals from the urine would keep the gas out. There's a milkman in London in 1917, maybe called Mick Wall who used to water down milk to make it go further. Firstly, that was illegal to do, but secondly, he got the water from the public toilets. In World War I, France built a fake Paris to try to throw off the German bombers, and it even had a fake railway that would light up to look like a moving train. Arthur John Priest survived a weird amount of shipwrecks. He was stoking the Titanic, but survived the sinking with only frostbite. Then he survived the Alcantara, which was a World War I battleship that sank in battle in 1916. Then he's, well, he survived and went on to serve the Britannic. And then the Donegal, both wartime ships that sank, that he survived. From 1912 to 1948, medals were given out for arts-based competitions during the Olympics. Medals were given out for literature, painting, music or sculpture, but they all had to be Olympic-themed. Violet Jessup served as a stewardess and nurse on all three of the White Star Line's trio of ships, meaning she survived the Titanic and Britannic disasters and the Olympics crash with a warship. The first patent for nail varnish was in 1919 and it was a light pink revolutionary beauty product. Do you remember when planking was a thing? Well, a similar thing happened in the 1920s when people would just climb up flagpoles and sit on top for a while. The women who worked in watch factories during the 1920s developed horrific diseases. The radium girls worked at the Radium Corp in America, which used radium to make their watches glow in the dark. The women would lick their paintbrushes to give them a sharper point when painting on the radium, which led to a whole range of horrific things. Some of their legs broke, their spines broke down, and one lady went to the dentist to have a tooth out and her jaw fell out instead. America's biggest con man somehow sold the Eiffel Tower twice in a criminal career that ended in Alcatraz. Among his many other dangerous scams, in 1925, he presented as a French government official and invited the highest people in the French scrap metal industry to a meeting where he told them that because of engineering faults, costly repairs and problems he couldn't discuss, the Eiffel Tower would be torn down and sold to the highest bidder. And he pulled that scam off twice. In 1931, both Churchill and Hitler were hit by cars by accident. During World War II, cardboard cutouts of planes and tanks were used to trick the German planes flying over that that was where the army was. The Nazis, among the many awful things they did, actually used the guillotine. And in 1936, they were distributed to prisons, with over 16,000 people being killed with them. During World War II, the British troops kept stopping to have a cup of tea, and then they would get caught out by the Nazis. So each tank was fitted with a kettle, so they could have tea on the go. Perhaps the most ridiculous ghost story from history comes when Winston Churchill 
was staying at the White House and walked out of his bath into the bedroom where he saw Abraham Lincoln stood by the fireplace. He smiled and disappeared. The ghost, that is. Hans Schwarf was the Luftwaffe's master interrogator, whose technique was just to be as nice as possible. To get information from prisoners, he would take them outside for a walk, bake homemade goods, or even have a tea party with them. And it was so successful that it was incorporated into the US military training program. Russia ran out of vodka 22 hours after it was announced that World War II was over. The last state prisoner to be held in the Tower of London was Rudolf Hess, the deputy leader of the Nazis in 1941. But the Cray Twins were held there in the 50s. McDonald's was founded on the 15th of May 1940, and five days later, prisoners were taken to concentration camps like Auschwitz. The last person to be imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was imprisoned in 1943. Helen Duncan was a Scottish medium accused of fraudulent spiritual activity. When the London Underground opened, the American Civil War was still going on. The first Star Wars film came out in 1977, which is also when the last execution happened in France. Star Wars was released in 1977 too. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth II was born in the same year as Marilyn Monroe. Neil Armstrong was a teenager when Orville Wright, the inventor of the aeroplane, died. Betty White was nine years old when Thomas Edison died, and Pablo Picasso was born before and died after Jimi Hendrix. And that brings us, apparently, to the modern era. It wasn't really in order, was it? But it kind of was. I really do hope you've enjoyed. Please do let me know in the comments if you did. <laughs> um, don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you're not already asleep. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.